This is Judy Rodman from All Things Vocal, and you're listening to the Musicality Podcast. Ever wondered why some people seem to have a gift for music? Have you ever wished that you could play by ear, sing in tune, improvise and jam? You're in the right place. Time to turn those wishes into reality. Welcome to the Musicality Podcast with your host, Christopher Sutton. Hi, this is Christopher, founder of Musical You, and welcome to the Musicality Podcast. Today I'm speaking with Judy Rodman of judyrodman.com and the All Things Vocal blog. Judy went from being a professional jingle singer in the 70s to getting a recording contract as a singer and having a Billboard number one song to writing songs and having one of them become a number one hit for Leanne Ryan, to now being an in-demand vocal coach in Nashville and the creator of the All Things Vocal blog and podcast. With that incredible career, it would be easy to assume Judy has a gift or that she relied on natural talent. But as you'll learn in this conversation, it wasn't all smooth sailing and it was a particular mindset that allowed Judy to have such success in so many different arenas in music. It's also abundantly clear from this conversation that Judy has soaked up an incredible amount of learning along the way, and she excels in sharing that expertise in a clear and valuable way for her students. In this conversation, we talk about what it was that let her succeed again and again as she pivoted her music career through the years. The two areas she recommends that beginning singers focus on and specific exercises to help them with both. The number one most important thing to focus on as a singer if you want to improve and have a good sounding voice. How studio singing differs from singing on stage and a clever device that can help you past that feeling of thinking you sound odd or bad when you hear yourself on a recording. There is a ton packed into this conversation and whether you have never sung before or you sing and want to get better or you're already performing on stage and in the studio, there is going to be something valuable for you to take away. And I know you're going to want to immerse yourself more in everything Judy offers to help singers. My name is Christopher Sutton, and this is the Musicality Podcast from Musical You. Welcome to the show, Judy. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation to join you. What a fascinating podcast you have. Thank you very much. You have had an incredible career, and I I feel almost sheepish asking you to tell us about it because there is so much (laughs) we could talk about. Um, But if you wouldn't mind, could you tell us a bit about how you got started in music and what those early experiences were like for you? Well, at this point, I've been singing, you know, professionally for for like 50 years. And um, and I started singing when I was a small, small child. And I started singing with my family. Uh, My father was an air traffic controller and we just had jam sessions. So I learned to sing harmony within those jam sessions and all that. And, uh, you know, I I lived in Miami for a while. I lived a bunch of different places. But when uh, we moved to Jacksonville, uh, I was I was going to be a, a research scientist of all things in Miami, and the trajectory got sort of changed when we moved to Jacksonville because those educational opportunities did not exist. So, I <laughs> I went for my other passion, which was music. You know, I'd always been a musician. You know, I'm playing guitar, playing piano, and singing. And I ended up. Long story short, uh, my choir director was. Uh, got involved in doing jingles. So he asked me to join with him and his wife and I sang my first national jingle at 17. So it was for Gino's pizza logs of all things. And uh, then after that, I eventually moved to Memphis with my family and got a full-time job as a jingle singer in a, as a staff singer in a jingle company, which meant I sang from 8.30 in the morning till 3.30 in the afternoon, five days a week, sometimes six. And at the same time, I started doing background vocals in some of the uh, the uh, studios in Memphis uh, with, with a couple of the people that I sang jingles with. And I was in a pop uh, top 40 group where I met my to-be husband. And so I learned, you know, I, did, I had no idea all the stuff I was learning, but I was learning so much that would come in handy later, you know, including how to dissect songs and 
uh, how to sing with surgical precision with jingles and all that. Uh, so I've eventually had a child. And when I had a child, I had medical complications, which created vocal damage from an endotracheal tube. So I thought that was the end of the world. But what it was, was the end of me being in Memphis because we had to move. We moved to, uh, we moved to Nashville. My husband was a session drummer, but you know, both of us were doing sessions. So we moved to Nashville for more opportunity a couple of years later after I started healing. And then I learned so much in the healing process, uh, both from doing some classical uh, art songs uh, to work my head voice back up and get my voice flexible again and recover from what, what we thought was permanent scar tissue. And then also uh, I had a vocal coach in, in, in Nashville uh, who worked with the other background vocalists at the time and helped me get not only my whole voice back, but another whole step I'd never had. I'd never had. And then two years later, or I guess two years later after I started working with him, about four years after I moved from Nashville, here's the value of vocal coaching. Uh, I had a, a record deal and a number one record. I won uh, Academy of Country Music New Vocalist of the Year Award and was on everything from The Tonight Show to Austin City Limits and all that other stuff. So, uh, and then... I thought the end of the world had come again because my label folded. Uh, it was bought by BMG, which just didn't want a record label. So overnight, I didn't exist. And it was crushing, crushingly uh, fail, a failed feeling. And I didn't know what I would do, but I had a family. And I had to, you know, my I, I needed to help support my family and all this. So I had to go on and I had started writing songwriting as part of my artistic career. And I'd never thought of myself as a songwriter. I had written one song while I was recovering my voice in Memphis. And then when I got to Nashville, which is the center of songwriter, uh, you know, universe, I, I, I kept writing and writing more and then had, you know, recorded a lot of that stuff as an artist. So after the artist thing folded, the only thing I had to left to lean on, it looked like, was songwriting. So a few years later, I had a number one rec record as a songwriter. Uh, one Way Ticket, because I can, Leanne Rhymes. I co-wrote that with a guy named uh, Keith Hinton. And then the songs I was writing fell out of favor with commercial radio, and I failed once again. <laughs> or I came up on the brick wall once again. And I thought to myself, okay, I can either design organic garden or gardens, which I love. I love organic gardening and, and keeping fish and stuff. I'm ecology minded. Or this this girl that I'd worked with, Carol Chase, who was on the road with Leonard Skinner, the band Leonard Skinner. She was doing backgrounds, and I, I used to write with her and used to do a lot of background vocals with her. So we were real good friends. So she came to me and said, asked me, she asked me how to hit this high note that she was having trouble with on the road. And I'm thinking, how do you think I know how to help you? But she had been with me in sessions and she knew that somehow I, you know, I, I, had, I had directed a lot of sessions and, and all this and arranged a lot of stuff. And she innately sort of knew I knew. So she gave me the confidence to think, well, okay, it's either organic, organic gardening or maybe I could teach somebody to sing. And I put two articles in the paper or two ads, one for designing organic gardens and one for vocal coaching. This being Nashville, guess which one took off? <laughs> <laughs> so I started doing that. And then I, in the process, I realized that I did have a, a, you know, an affinity for diagnosing and uh, suggesting the fixes for vocal problems. And through the years, I got really curious about it and I started really studying why. I knew what worked for my students and for myself in, through, the, through all my career. But I was like, why is this working and how can I make it work better? So I studied other coaches. I studied... Uh, uh, 
you know, Alexander Technique a little bit, uh, had a guy double team a few students with me, uh, my chiropractor, my family who were medical doctors and nurse practitioners. And, and just, I got really curious and just, just looked everywhere for uh, uh, help to help me understand what was working and how I can make it work even better. And slowly but surely, I came upon my own method, which I use today called Power Path and Performance, which is putting together throat, uh, 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 breath, throat, and communication techniques. So I started vocal coaching and, and just, you know, I, I actually woke up crying because I was too busy and I didn't know what I was going to do. I was going to take all the students that were coming to me. So what I ended up doing is raising my rates until that many students <laughs> stopped coming. And now I'm about where I want to be. So uh, that, but, you know, I had to sort of figure out my life within that and, you know, how, how to go forward with that. So then everything felt, you know, started coming around. My students needed to be, uh, some of my students wanted to, to go in the recording studio and record some of their songs. So I had produced tracks my whole life, practically, from the demos I did from songwriting, you know, to working with people in the studio and masters and everything else. So I found that I was a good produ producer, too, and that uh, I also joined with other production teams as vocal producer, which I did yesterday. And so I got, you know, and, and some of my students needed songs to uh, go into the studio with. So I got back into the the songwriting thing. And now I'm like, I, I get to play with all my toys again <laughs> on behalf <laughs> of other people and being the wind underneath other people's art and just coming full circle with it. So th that kind of brings you up to speed. And, and then the one last thing is I actually went in and recorded my own project again uh, in 2015. So that's that's where I'm at right now. Well, I, I think I speak on behalf of all our <laughs> listeners when I say, wow, <laughs> um, that is quite a journey you've had. And there's so much there that I want to unpack and, and hear more about. Um, let's dig in, if you wouldn't mind, to one of the earlier experiences you had, which was being a jingle singer, because I think that's mm -hmm. something that you know, we all hear jingles here and there, but probably a lot of us don't really think about what goes into creating them. And I, I know I was surprised when I heard that you were singing 8.30 to 3.30, five days a week. I, it's hard to imagine there are that many jingles. <laughs> um, can you tell us a bit about what that was like as a young singer to t step into that role and need to, you know, perform with, as you put it, surgical precision? Right. Uh, I think I was about 20 when I got the staff job, the, the staff uh, jingle singing job. And at that time, this was, this was the 70s, and uh, almost every product you can imagine had a jingle that went with it back in those days. It's not that way anymore. But also, all the radio stations, uh, of course, needed jingle packages and needed uh, radio IDs, W, ba -da -ba, you know, that kind of thing. And so I had to learn to sing, you know, there, there was in the 70s, there was no pitch fixing unless we did it ourselves. And so, you know, there was the, the, uh, editing involved blood because people, you know, they, they, uh, they used razor blades to splice the tape together if they wanted to edit something. So we tried to require as little blood out of our engineers as possible. <laughs> and so we had to learn to do cutoffs precisely to shape vowels like the group leader said, you know, determined to do it and make that a quick decision to uh, pronounce things exactly the same, to sustain uh, notes exactly the same, to fall off, to, you know, swell, to, and all of this was reading music because of course we can't memorize that much stuff from 8.30 in the morning, 3.30 and each day it was new stuff. So uh, I had to, you know, learn to be a ninja reader of, of, uh, you know, vocal manuscript and all that. And then uh, it, it was just an amazing, in fact, I'll tell you the first thing I learned what, uh, from my group, my first group leader that was uh, in the jingle singing was that if I was just a tiniest bit under zero degrees, as far as the pitch went, just a tiny bit low, uh, he said, 
do the inner smile on it, do an inner smile on it. And it lifted it right in the middle of zero. So that's the first thing I learned from jingle singing was how to fix a slightly flat pitch. And I went from there. It sounds like an incredible boot camp for singing to, as, yeah, ninja is the right word, I think, because it there was. are many singers who have that kind of pressure on them. It um, was, and it was paying dues too, because it, you know, it, they, they really abused us pretty much. You know, I think uh, I, for some singers, it's some of these, uh, uh, like Six Flags Over Georgia or, or uh, Opryland at the time, there are places where young singers get abused a lot because they don't pay them very much and they require them to sing all the time. You might want to embrace that for a little while anyway, <laughs> because you do, it is boot camp for, for learning what, what you need to know. And then later on, it came in handy because me having to match other people's voices, other soloists and uh, other styles, you know, we were always mimicking whatever pop song was coming out, uh, was out at the time. I, eventually had to do that with background vocals. Um, there's a lot of difference between like Barbara Mandrell and uh, Ray Charles, say. You know, uh, it, you had to learn to be a chameleon or like I like to say, a stunt singer. And all that jingle singing, learning to morph my throat channel and change the way my sound was. It's almost like being a, uh, well, it is very much like being a voiceover artist, which I end up teaching because of the, all these changes I know. Mm. So I, after that very intense early experience, I can only imagine how crushing it was to be forced to step back for a little while due to injury. And I think we could probably find a lot of people in the world who had a bit of musical success in their early 20s, something forced them to stop and they either never went back to it or the rest of their life it was always just a kind of side thing or they dabbled or it was never quite the same again. You managed to turn it not once but several times in a new direction over the course of your career and I'd love to hear why you think that was possible or what enabled you to have such success again and again in different directions in music. One thing I have learned is to be on roller skates. And I think that's one of the most valuable thing that you can, uh, things that you can teach people these days. And that is learning to learn and looking for where your passion meets the world's needs. So it's not just what I want to do, but what is out there is needed. Look at reality and then get creative and look for windows of opportunity. I think that's what I ended up doing. I just, I had to do it. I think that uh, maybe all the moves that, that I made or whatever, but uh, you know, helped me to, to, to do that, to choose to believe I could do something I'd never done. In the South here, there's a funny saying, uh, what's the famous last words of a redneck? And that's, hey, y'all, watch this. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, if you understand that, uh, it, it's it's like, uh, I'm going to do this or I am this or whatever. And if I don't know how to do this, I'm going to learn. I'm on a need to know basis. And just like the vocal coaching to everything else, if I need to know, I will find out. I will I will find the places or the people uh, that know, and I'll learn what I need to know to do what is helping might help me go through that open window. So I think it's that creative thinking. It's the creative thought process and the belief that you aren't in a box, even when you are in a box, because you're never in a box. Wow. I, I love that answer. I, I think one of the things I love most about it is that the word talent didn't come up once. <laughs> I think a lot of people with oh, your no. success would say, well, I, I guess I was just <laughs> gifted. Um, but clearly with you, it was a very intentional mindset and um, drive that led you to find the opportunities and to follow through on them and, and to earn that success. And not expect it. I think the other thing is you did not to get bitter when um, when I hit a brick wall now that won't let me go in the direction I think I want to go, now I don't get bitter about the brick wall. I just see it as a turning place. 
And I just, okay, there's the brick wall. It's, you know, there's reality. Let me just make a little turn here and see what's around the corner. Because mm-hmm. bitterness is never an artist's friend. And, I, and, and when I say artist, I don't mean, you know, necessarily that you're doing it full time or that you're, you know, a, a quote unquote professional. Um, that's just about business, not, not art. Uh, if you want to be professional and meaning commercial, you want to have uh, some commercial success with your voice. You have to learn two things to do two things really well. One is your art and the other is your business. But a lot of times it's the amateur that's way better than the professional in the arts. Ask Van Gogh. He thought of himself as a total failure. Yeah. So he was priceless. And that's that's the thing. I, I really help my students do that because I you know, have a lot of students that aren't in they're coming to me so that they can make money with their voices. They're coming to me because they feel the deep need to express themselves through their voices. And it's just a great passion of theirs to want to do that as best they can, because it's fun. And it's also it, it also fills a hole in their in their spirit that if they don't create in some way will feel like it's empty i think the career journey you've had gives you a fascinatingly broad perspective on learning to sing you know from being that intense jingle singer to being a lead singer a singer songwriter a backing vocalist a vocal coach um you've kind of seen it all and i'd love to hear your perspective on how someone should think about learning to sing. You know, at Musical U, we find people come to us and they either think they can't sing and we're trying to help them kind of take the first steps and realize singing is a possibility, or they come to us and they've always kind of sung just for the fun of it, but they want to become a good singer, as they put it. They want to sound good. And Mm -hmm. I think because the voice is internal to us, we have a very different relationship to it than, say, learning guitar or learning piano And it can be quite difficult, I think, whichever of those two camps someone is in, to see a path forward in terms of what they should be learning or how they should think about what can be learned versus what's just inherently physically their voice. How do you help your students to think about that big picture of becoming a good singer? Okay, first of all, uh, for those who don't think they can sing, um, why are they there? Well, because they feel a need to. And I swear, I really believe this. The only difference between the people that can't sing and the people that do sing is the people that, uh, you know, are the, I mean, that learn to sing uh, is the want to. Like my husband's a drummer and there is no amount of money that I could pay him to make him let me give him vocal lessons. All right. He's a professional drummer and he has no desire to sing. Thank you very much. So I don't know why, but. That's just the way it is. So he can't learn to sing. But that's only that's the only reason. The two biggest uh, impediments I find with beginner singers that they need to work on is one is a, a, a lack of a sense of pitch and two, a lack of a sense of rhythm. And you can work on both the skills. They are just skills. OK, I teach people uh, what I call uh, pitch practice, uh, aiming practice. And that is the the first step is to actually listen. That's what people, they just usually just throw themselves at the pitch and pit, pitch, uh, throw their voices at the pitch and wish it luck. It's like the vocal uh, equivalent of pin the tail on the donkey. And it can end up in some very weird places. So, but when I get them to stop and listen, so it, it's a three-step process of uh, miming. I'll, I'll say, I'll play a note in, in the middle of where I think their range is, in the middle of the piano, and I'll say, listen, and imagine yourself singing that. So let your ear absorb that sound and intend to do that. Okay, now mime it with a, with a syllable such as yaw. So if it's the pitch is that, I would have them go, listen first, and then and I'm, I'm silently mouthing the word yaw, the syllable yaw. And then I'll say, okay, and, and ma- imagine yourself singing it. So that's two ways to imagine the pitch. 
And the second way involves some physicality. Okay. So then I'll say, okay, if you think you got it in your mind, then try to put a little bit of sound to it. Yeah, yeah. And if it's off, I'll say, you know, I'll say, you know, raise, you know, I'll bring my hands up or lower my hands until they find it. And I'll, and they have to learn to take it really slow, even if they're great singers, but they just don't tend to have a good pitch center or they're doing you know, the national anthem, and it ends up in two different keys <laughs> uh, when it gets high, that kind of thing. You have to get slow and listen, mime it, then sing it. And the more you do it, if you do it for a week, for like sit down and for 10 minutes, try to do it, either piano, guitar, virtual piano on the on the internet, you can use that. But you, you'd be amazed at how your aim gets better. And as far as rhythm goes, my suggestion there is to, you, you know, take dance or take drum lessons and immerse yourself in pattern, in patterns of rhythm. And then the rest, oh my goodness, I can, you know, it, it, the, the sound of the voice really should have to do with what the heck are you saying and who are you talking to? And what would that, what should that sound be? to get the response from the person that you're talking to. So instead of me sounding good, and then we're moving over to the second set of people now, the people who uh, want to sound good, that's so counterproductive to the workings of the voice. That's like riding a horse and saying, horse, move good. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. So instead, I teach people to go, okay, to whom is this lyric directed? Not Usually not the audience. And even if it is, make it to the one heart of the audience. If you can imagine you two in a stadium, well, they're like singing every song to the one heart of the, of the auditorium. Okay, what heart? The heart the lyric is to. That's very important. Sometimes it's not to uh, the audience. Sometimes you can sing this song called How Great Thou Art, which is a Christian song. And, and I've heard people sing that and really mean, deliver this message. How great did I not just hit that note? <laughs> That's meaningless, you know, or, you know, uh, you might win uh, England's Got Talent or whatever the, your version of, uh, of that is, uh, the, the TV show. But then 15 minutes later, it doesn't matter because all you did was make a wonderful, loud, splashy sound. But you didn't you weren't an artist. You didn't deliver a message. So if, if people get a rudimentary sense of pitch and rhythm, then I just position them posturally where the head is over the tailbone and the heel instead of the balls of the feet. And that opens up your breath and that opens up your throat. And all of a sudden at the first lesson, they're singing better than they have in their lives. But you have to know who you're talking to and what you want them to know and then further, what would that look like on their body language and their facial language? In other words, what would their response be as you're saying this? Because that determines your tone that you're using, uh, the degree of articulation. If you're, if you're being really muddy with your words, they can't respond because they don't know what the heck you're saying. So it determines so much when you get back to what is this thing in the middle of my neck for? It's for delivering messages. And that's whether, you know, even if you are in the commercial field of that, you better be delivering messages because that's what makes your voice valuable. If that wasn't true, then such singers as Bob Dylan, um, the early Taylor Swift, uh, you know, all kinds of, of uh, you know, singers that you don't think of as vocalists would never have had a career. But they know what I'm saying. They they know in, innately. They know this thing. Oh, I'm I'm delivering messages. Like when you paint, you're delivering messages. And that other that also takes care of the fear factor, because it's not about you anymore. You're doing everything. You'd stand on your head if you could to get the response from the heart you're singing to. So does that does that make sense? Incredible. Yeah, I think that's a really elegant mindset for singers to have about what matters and what doesn't. And I believe right. you go into more detail and more 
more of a kind of framework for thinking about this in your book, Power, Path and Performance. Is that right? Yeah, it's it actually a, a six disc set. I've got a one disc version of it, but it's CDs and with a, a DVD video on the sixth one. It's audio CDs, and a DVD video, and also a digital download for people that don't have laptops that have CDs in them anymore. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I go into, uh, you, you know, you're going to learn to sing with tools. One of the tools is knowing a little bit about anatomy. You don't have to know a whole lot, but you do want to know why the heck is this making a difference if I stand at the wall? What's that doing? It helps you uh, use the techniques better instead of just, you know, doing it and not knowing why. So I teach uh, with anatomy and then imagery because you, you can't any more than you can fly a jumbo jet on manual for very long. The the singing voice, the bells and whistles, the all the the apparatus, the movements that the apparatus makes, you can't consciously make that happen. And if you dwell on it on t- technique too much, uh, then you're then you're in trouble. So I use imagery as well, and I in different people being different, I use uh, sometimes different mind pictures to uh, to help people sense what I'm trying to teach them. So if somebody's leaning forward too much, I'll tell them something like, imagine a space invader is coming at you with bad breath and, it, and they'll back up. OK, if somebody's back backing up too far, I'll say, OK, bobble your head on top of your spine like a bobble headed doll, you know, and I'll get the stiffness out and get them balanced better. So it's all, you know, to you need to be creative. but the, those discs have a lot of different ways to go about it. But then you need to learn how to do vocal exercises because you can do vocal exercises and hurt yourself. So I'm very uh, careful in the course to uh, teach people how to do each exercise that, that I give them. And then, of course, the vocal exercises uh, and uh, and the demonstration of the exercises with the video. But I also go into the psychology of the voice, which is I gave you a little bit about just then, so that I teach how to get the breath balanced, the breath support and, be- and, and breath control balanced. I teach how to maintain an open throat no matter what you're singing so that you never experience vocal fatigue or tightness unless you want a tight sound for a particular delivery, okay? And then performance, meaning what the heck is this thing in the middle of my neck for? Delivering messages. And the psychology that can go into helping you focus your mind on what it's all supposed to do. And these three things are synergistic, breath, throat, and communication. They affect each other. So put them all together and they help each, they help, you know, get one, one thing better and all of it's better. So it's pretty, pretty radical. It also helps prevent and actually help this, the, the voice heal itself, prevent damage and irritation and fatigue, uh, vocal fatigue, and help the voice heal itself if it's sustained some damage because of the efficient way that the instrument is used. That sounds like an amazing course of instruction that would solve a lot of problems, I think, for a lot of singers. Um, who is this mostly for? You know, is this something someone can take on from the outset in singing? Do they need oh, yes. a bit of experience yeah. under their belt? Or? Uh, when I created the course, you know, p- part of my uh, value system, I, I don't want to just teach rich people. My price is, is, you know, pretty high, but I don't want to just teach professional artists and rich people. I want everybody to be able to have this. So I created different ways to make anybody, no matter what their income, be able to train with, with my method. And um, I took probably about a year and a half to, to actually record this course and create it. I, uh, it took about $12,000 uh, to, to do it because I kept changing it. And I actually recorded the vocal in the studio, the the uh, my speaking voice teaching in in a studio. But I, I I would show it to a focus group because I wanted people that had in the focus group had never taken voice and were not professional voices, and I wanted to make sure that no matter who you were, if you want to sing, 
you can learn. So that it's it's also for professional voices as well. It's like the kind of course that you can study at one level and then listen to it again and get it, you know, get different things out of it and listen to it again. And it's not just a, you know, once and done kind of thing, but no matter where you are, if you want to sing, that's what I designed the the course based on my method for. Amazing. One of the transitions you made along the way was from being kind of a prominent lead on stage singer to working more in the studio as a backing vocalist or a vocal coach. How How is that situation different? Did you find you needed to adapt your technique or adapt the way you approached singing when you were more in the studio environment? When I'm in the studio, I have some what I call ninja tricks because the studio is difficult for several reasons, uh, especially if you're a veteran stage singer. Uh, it can be frustrating because all of a sudden, you know, you can't sing as well as you can on stage and you don't understand why. Well, one of, you know, there's several reasons off the top of my head. One of them is it's kind of a weird environment. You know, the audience is not there. It's just the engineer or the producer in there making faces because his gear is not functioning properly and you think he thinks you suck. So, you know, there's that. And, and the other thing is, you don't have your mic in your hand or your guitar or your piano under your hands. That changes what happens in your rib cage. Okay. So what I teach people, and I usually use a back scratcher. I'm going to use this ruler right now to show you, uh, but I'll, I'll teach them to use a stick in the studio and just, you know, Use the stick and it just widens your ribcage just to have it in your hand, in your hands like you do your instrument. Or put your fingertips together and sing that way. You know, with your finger, with, when your fingertips are pressing into each other, you'll notice your ribcage opens. It's also how you're standing at a mic. Uh, most of the time, very few engineers know this, by the way. Most of the time you walk into a vocal booth and what's in front of the mic? The music stand and the cue box. You need to move the music stand and the cue box at least to the side so you can walk in to the mic. And when you do that, your head has to go back or your mouth will hit the pop filter. So guess what? Your rib cage is open and you have better breath control. You have better control of your voice then. And all of a sudden you can sing better. Um, some people just talk with their hands. That's part of this. Uh, the 911, though, for a difficult thing, uh, is is when you connect the circuit around, you know, either with something in your hands or your fingertips together to widen the circle of your rib cage to give you control. And so that's physical. Uh, that's a physical thing about the studio. The psychological thing about the studio is don't sing to the pop filter. It doesn't care what you're saying. And good luck getting a response from it. Don't sing to the producer he, unless he is the person you're you're singing to, you know, it's very rare that that happens. Don't sing uh, to the air. Don't sing to nobody. You've got to pick that heart to sing to, and you've got to go into that like a movie scene, and you're going to sing through the pop filter and the mic like that's the hole in the fence to the heart across from you. So in these ways, the studio is different than live stage. You also have to imagine the response uh, because, you know, the audience is not there. <laughs> and if it is there, and the, you know, you want, usually you want as few people as possible in the control room. That's another thing you need to know about the studio because you don't want to be distracted. And so, uh, I mean, some people like to have people in the studio because they are singing to that, that one heart of that, that group and it makes them do that, uh, makes them feel like they're on stage. But that's rare. So uh, it's there's a lot of things, little specialty things about the studio that if you know it beforehand, you can uh, actually save yourself money because you're going to use less studio time to get a better and more effective, passionate vocal than you could otherwise. That's great. I, I asked partly because having heard a bit about power path and performance, I think it would be easy for our listeners to think, well, that's all I need. That's, that's singing sorted. Um, but on, on your website, you also have this course singing in the studio. 
and it might not be immediately obvious right. why you need that alternative course or the additional course. Um, but I think you've just painted a very vivid picture of how different it can be and how you need a few of those ninja tricks up your sleeve to to have success in the studio. Right. And with the singing in the studio course, uh, it's on DVD with a bunch of files that you download. And, and part of that is a, a vocal warm up for the studio. So uh, it's got a little power path and performance in it. In other words, if it's not kind of you can pick both or you can just pick one. If you're going into the studio and you're already singing well live on stage uh, and you don't have the money for both of them uh, or the time to study both of them, you know, you can, you can get both or you can get the one. Uh, it's, I just want to be practical with, with what people really need. So, uh, yeah. And I also have for people that have uh, studios, whether you're professional or amateur, because you're, you love having, you have, having fun recording your voice on a kind of an amateur basis for whatever reason, or you're a songwriter. Um, I have a course also, called Vocal Production Workshop, which is for audio engineers, so that you know how to help your singer or help yourself, uh, you know, what what you need. Uh, it's not a gear-based a gear based thing. It's a, uh, what does the singer need? So if any, you know, anybody, any of the listeners there have their own home studios, uh, they can do either singing in the studio or Vocal Production Workshop, and they have a lot of similar ideas, but just from different vantage points. Perfect. So one other thing I was really keen to hear about was a product you offer on your website called Hearphones, which it made immediate sense to me. You know, we, we've had an episode on the podcast in the past about recording yourself and how that can help you improve. But I know that particularly for singers, absolutely, the, the feedback we immediately get is, oh, I sound terrible. I can't listen to myself sing. And I, I'd love to hear about Hearphones and how maybe they can help with that um, self-awareness as a singer right well in the first place a lot of times people are appalled not they don't even realize that it's not that they they sound bad it's that they sound different they're so not used to that being what they sound like but your our ears are on the side of for most of us on the side of our heads (laughs) so we can't immediately directly hear what our voices sound like and that is always uh kind of a shock and uh, so what they really need is a way to hear how they really sound rather than how they think they sound, how they sound to others. And you can put your hand up, you know, cup, cup your ear like that. That's the time honored way to do that. But this little gadget that was created in, in, um, uh, by two guys in Maine uh, called Hearphones have some protruding plastic extensions that catch the vocal sound and deliver it back to the ears. And it's an acoustic device, no batteries or electricity or anything like that. So it instantly picks up what you really sound like. And oh my gosh, is that illuminating? And first, first of all, you get used to it. You can change the levels by tipping it up or down and, uh, uh, you know, catching less of your voice. But it's so great for honing in on pitch and tone and backing off your excessive pressure because you you, you don't want to yell at yourself. You know, that really helps me train people that sing too, too loud with too much force. That's not good for the throat anyway. And nobody wants to be yelled at. (laughs) So uh, it's just a great little training device or practice device. I also use it, it. It's also a good thing to use for people that need to or want to use in-ear monitors because it's like that as well. So uh, it's just it's good if you're just singing live, uh, if you are a guitar player and you want to, you know, sing at the same time and hear your voice while you're playing guitar. Uh, it's, it's just a cool little device. It sounds like it solves a whole bunch of problems there. And it's, I'll, mm-hmm. I'll say for anyone who's trying to imagine it, it is a bit funny looking when you see it. <laughs> but, it is. you know, some of the best things in life do not appear as useful as they genuinely are. And I think you will definitely have to head to Judy's website to take a look at the earphones and see if they might be useful for you and your singing. Um, so the, the last thing I wanted to touch on was um, something you mentioned there at the end of uh, your 
amazingly brief synopsis of an incredibly action-packed career, <laughs> which was that you haven't the roller let, skates. <laughs> exactly. Um, you haven't let your artistic side dwindle, um, despite having great success now as a vocal coach and all the amazing content you're publishing um, on your All Things Vocal blog and podcast. You found the time to work with your husband and put together an album of original songs. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yes, and this might be really interesting to allude back to something you said to people who, for whatever reason, stopped some kind of singing for a while and then then didn't know what to do to pick it back up. My husband was a uh, high level professional drummer, uh, session player. He did jingles and and records, and was on the road with me, in fact, uh, as well when I did have the artist career, but. He 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 stopped playing. He just the joy of it. Just you know, he was going through through some things, some uh, depression that had to do with the thyroid deal that we didn't know about. But for you know whatever reason, he quit. He stopped playing and lost his love for creating like that. And uh, I just thought I just never quite felt done. And I never quite felt like he was done. And one day we were watching James Taylor and uh, Carol King uh, at the, some, uh, I forgot the name of the place at the bottom line or something in New York uh, on TV. And I, we loved them and they moved us so much with, with their performance. And I looked at my husband and I said, you know, if we could make music like that, wouldn't it be worth doing? And I expected him to roll his eyes like he usually does, you know, and like, yeah, right. But to my surprise, he said, yes. So about a year later, he's picking up his drumsticks again. He said at first his golf clubs felt more normal in his hands than his drumsticks did. And he was too embarrassed to play in front of me. He wouldn't practice in front of me. He waited till I left the house silly man but he 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 started playing and then he got it he could not only got it back but there was a joy about his playing and a fresh fire about it and then he and I just started playing around with music like the old jam things you know that I grew up doing we just started playing around and he'd play these funny little grooves and I'd play something on a piano and then I'd think about what, I wonder what that's saying. You know, I'd try to ask myself what it's saying. You know, I, I got a couple of people that uh, I usually used in the studio, some musician friends of mine, and they came over and we started playing and jamming and stuff. And then we started playing out. And before you know it, John and I have written, you know, a new album. And so we recorded it in 2015. And I made the conscious choice. We made the conscious choice that we did not want to tour. We did not want to pour a lot of money and promotion and all this kind of stuff that we were just happy with the feedback and the response that we got standing ovation at our, uh, at our little showcase thing that we did and all this, that our bass player was one of the G G men who works with Garth on the road. And he passed away last year. And so we, we no longer have the band that we that we started with. So I don't know if we'll ever do much of anything again, but I would never give anything for having that album that I can we can put in the car and play. And, you know, people are still buying it on the Internet and all this. And, and like I say, we've gotten all kinds of response to it. So it it fulfills our artistic hearts. And to this day, my husband is still playing. We're about to play for church next Sunday for this Presbyterian church thing. And and we just, we just get together with a couple of other musicians and kind of jam, work something up. And it's back to doing it for the love of the music. That's beautiful. Judy, it has been such a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. And for all our listeners who've enjoyed this conversation, I think we've only scratched the surface of Judy's experience <laughs> and and the insights she has for singers, whether you're at the beginning of the journey or further along. And you certainly will have to check out judyrodman.com, where you'll find the All Things Vocal blog, the podcast, the courses we talked about. And if you're interested to hear, here we are, the album she put together with her husband, that's at johnandjudyrodman.com. We'll have links to all of that in the show notes, as usual. 
Thank you again so much, Judy. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I wish everyone out there just uh, keep doing it for the love of it and see where it goes. Want to know how musical you are and how to improve? Find out free at musicalitypodcast.com slash checklist. Wow. I told Judy after we stopped recording that I was going to have a hard time summarizing that amazing conversation for this outro segment, and I wasn't wrong. I'll do my best. It's not easy to quickly convey how interesting, successful, and varied a career Judy has had so far, but I think she did a terrific job of telling the story from singing jingles to being a professional singer with a record contract to a songwriter with top chart hits to a vocal coach and creator of powerful self-study courses. It wasn't all smooth sailing, though, and it certainly wasn't down to a talent or a gift. Judy described it as learning to be on roller skates and be open to constantly learning new things and seeking out the opportunities where your passion matches up with what the world actually needs. I think that's something we can all learn from and put to use when life throws us a curveball. Jingle singing was an intense boot camp for Judy in her early 20s, requiring a precision of pitch, rhythm, enunciation, and more, which most singers are never forced to learn, but all could benefit from. Apart from precision, she also learned other skills which would prove useful later on, such as mimicking a particular style, which was going to help her as a backing singer. And I suspect this may also be where her insight on the prime importance of delivering a clear message with your singing was born. I asked Judy how aspiring singers should think about learning to sing, whether they're in that, oh, I can't sing phase, or they're already singing, but they want to sound better. She shared the aim your pitch exercise, which can help you hone in your tuning, whatever stage you're at. And she recommended tackling the rhythm side of things by using activities like dance or drumming, which immerse you in the world of rhythm. Aside from those fundamentals, she said the most important thing, above all else, is to remember that you are trying to communicate a message when you sing, and communicate it to one person. This is what guides you as you try to sound a certain way, and it's true whether you're alone, in front of an audience, or in the recording studio. Judy goes into more detail in her Power, Path, and Performance course, which addresses the breath, the throat, and the communication. The main three areas where she's seen that singers struggle or have room to improve. The course is intended for singers at all levels, and hearing her talk about it, it's clear that it can provide really practical and proven solutions to some of the most common problems that singers face. As well as experience in jingles and on stage, Judy has worked extensively in the studio, both singing herself and acting as a vocal producer or a coach, and so I was glad to have the chance to ask her how studio singing differs from singing on stage. She gave a few examples of her ninja tricks, which solve problems you might not even realise are going to occur in the studio, and I think if you've had challenges in the studio yourself or you're planning your first session, then her singing in the studio course could be just what you need to save time, money, and frustration. At Musical U, we're often hearing from our members that the first few times they record themselves singing, they're really surprised and unhappy with the way they sound. Judy pointed out that it is mostly your voice sounding different rather than bad, and she's discovered a clever product called Hearphones that you can wear to provide immediate feedback on how your voice actually sounds to other people. You can learn more about those as well as the courses on her website, judyrodman.com. There'll be a link in the show notes. After moving through so many career incarnations, each one successful, and culminating in focusing on teaching and coaching, it would be easy to assume Judy was done with creating and performing herself. So I so loved hearing the story of how writing and recording an album together with her husband not only kept her creative side alive, but actually drew him back into music making and reconnecting with the joy of it. You can hear their album at johnandjudyrodman.com. I don't think there have been many episodes of the Musicality podcast so far 
which were as value-packed as this one. And if you were inspired or enlightened by any of the tricks and ideas that Judy shared in this conversation, then there is plenty more waiting to delight you. Go check out the All Things Vocal blog and podcast, and the courses mentioned before at judyrodman.com. Thanks for listening to this episode. Stay tuned for our next one, where we'll be talking about why your own singing voice may sound bad or strange to you, and what you can do about it. Thank you for listening to the Musicality Podcast. This episode has ended, but your musical journey continues. Head over to musicalitypodcast.com, where you will find the links and resources mentioned in this episode, as well as bonus content exclusive for podcast listeners.